Hi everyone, today we are going to talk about pre and perinatal psychology and health. In recent years, revolutionary discoveries in genetics, neuroscience, and developmental psychology have transformed our understanding of infant development. Pre and perinatal psychology has reset the starting time of motherhood from after birth to before conception. I would like to welcome today Dr. Thomas Verney. He is a psychiatrist, writer, and academic. He has previously taught at several universities, such as Harvard University and the University of Toronto. Dr. Verney's book, The Secret Life of the Unborn Child, has been translated into 27 languages. His books, professional publications, and foundings of the now APA, Association for Prenatal and Perinatal Psychology and Health, and the Pre and Perinatal Journal, have established him as one of the world's leading authorities on the effect of the prenatal and early postnatal environment on personality development. He lectures today and leads workshops on prenatal and perinatal psychology and psychotherapy throughout the world. Hi, Dr. Thomas Verney. Thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure, totally. I would like to start by asking you, how did it come to your idea, to your knowledge, to start the work that and research that you do and what exactly is prenatal and perinatal psychology? Well, uh, that's a big question, actually. It is, I know. <laughs> uh, you know uh, being very much steeped in pre and perinatal psychology, I should probably go back to my birth, but that would take too long. <laughs> so we'll, we'll shorten that a little bit. Um, what started me was uh, that I, I was a psychiatrist, I was and still am a psychiatrist. And uh, I was doing therapy with a young man um, fairly early on in my career. And um, in the midst of discussing his dream, he started to cry like a little baby. So I did not interfere with him. And after about 10 minutes, he came out of it, so to speak. And he told me that he had just found himself in a crib, in a baby crib, and that he was crying for his mother. And then, being a somewhat skeptical young lawyer, he said, there's something wrong with this picture because just now, a minute ago, I actually saw myself in a white crib. And I have seen pictures of myself as a baby, and they were always in a blue crib. So I said to him, well, you know, go home, talk to your mother. She was still alive. Talk to your mother and find out. So he came back a week later and he said, this is amazing. But it seems that right after I was born, the first few weeks after I was born, my parents did not have enough money to buy me a crib. And so I was sleeping in a borrowed crib and that borrowed crib was white, not yeah. blue. Yeah. So there was no way that he could have known that. Like nobody ever talked to him about, you know, the color of his crib or anything like that. And he actually saw the blue crib. So I thought about that a little bit, but you know, I was very well educated and went to the University of Toronto. And like you said, also to Harvard. And we were always taught that children could not remember anything before the age of two. So then a few other things happened to me in, psych in psychotherapy um, until I began to sort of really begin to wonder, you know, whether sort of the accepted wisdom that we were being taught at university perhaps was not really factual. And so then I began to research and uh, uh, read in many different languages, different journals from New Zealand or from Germany or Sweden or whatever, Karolinska Institute in Sweden, you know, places like that. And so I began to piece together, you know, um, evidence from many different sciences that seem to point to the fact that we have, we have underestimated the, the, uh, the brain capacity, so to speak, the cognitive abilities 
of newborn and unborn children. And so I became more and more interested in this until I had, um, I had enough material to actually go and present a paper in, uh, in Rome at the Psychosomatic Obstetrics and Gynecology Conference, which is held every four years in different parts of the world. And so I presented a paper there and the response was so fantastic. Like everybody was kind of electrified by this news of mine, you know, that children actually can remember things that happened to them before the age of two. When I saw that kind of a response and interest, then I began to write the book. And then after the book was published, I would get, you know, correspondence from a lot of scientists uh, working in the area and almost like yourself, you know, they, they, they felt immediately kind of a uh, sympathy, sympathetic vibrations between me and them. And so then I, I had enough people then to start a conference in Toronto, the first pre and perinatal psychology association conference in Toronto. And then after that, we founded APA, the association for pre and perinatal psychology and health. So that in a nutshell is what happened. Now, what is pre and perinatal psychology you asked? Uh, well, it's, it's a little bit of, of a misnomer, but I have not been able to find a better term for it. Essentially, what it focuses on is the early childhood development from conception to about age two, mm -hmm. um, and everything that falls into the psychological area, such as uh, maternal anxiety, stress, prenatal communication, postnatal bonding and attachment, all of these different subjects fall into uh, the catchment area, so to speak, of pre and perinatal psychology. So we are interested in the mental and emotional development of the unborn and newborn child. Mm -hmm. And this, when you started, was this 30 years ago, right? Yes. yes. So you, you, were, you were a pioneer on the field. Yes. 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 It was so, very difficult. It was yeah. very, very difficult. Um, I, uh, I, I went on a book tour, for example, in England, I remember that, uh, and uh, first morning in London on the BBC, and there was a woman who was uh, going to interview me, and her first question was, Dr. Verney, I wish I could have an English accent, but I don't. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Verney, do you really believe that children can remember anything before their birth? You know, that kind like real negative, you know, that's, yeah. that, that's not the way to start the conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you really want to find out what the person has to say, you know, you don't start with kind of a uh, negative uh, mm -hmm. question, right? But that's, that's sort of very often what I got whenever I was being interviewed. And then um, every once in a while, um, some women uh, got upset with me because they said, on, on radio talk shows, sometimes I would hear, uh, here is another man who is telling us women what we should do with our bodies. Mm -hmm. And of course, I, I, I did no such a thing, you know. Mm -hmm. I just said that if you smoke, for example, uh, your child is going to suffer. It's your choice. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just giving you the information. So it was, it was, it was a difficult time. The first five Five years were very difficult, but then more and more good people, you know, began to see the light. <laughs> and continue to spread the word, which is, that's unfortunately in a lot of fields of science, science and psychology, that's how exactly it starts. So yes, I wanted is. to know on your research and all the work that you have done, how do babies have how do babies perceive the life in womb and how do they connect with their mother? Can you talk a little bit about this? Well, I think that, I think that you know, there's sort of, it, it, to my mind, there's sort of three channels through which a mother communicates with the baby and the baby in return communicates with the mother. And of course, the first one is, is very simple and, and that's neurohormonal, okay? Through the, through the placenta and the umbilical circulation, everything 
that sort of the mother experiences, like if she's anxious, you know, her adrenaline will go up, her cortisone levels will go up, all the stress hormones will increase and rise, and all of that is immediately passed on to the child. So when the mother is upset, the baby's upset simply because of the hormonal exchanges that go on. Then there are other influences too, of course. When the mother is upset, her heart will start pounding much faster. The baby can hear that, okay? From, we know that from about five to six months after conception, the baby's hearing is already well developed. And so the baby can hear everything that goes on. So the, the baby is always listening to the maternal circulation, to the heartbeat, to all the sounds that you make gastrointestinally when you are eating and the food is going through your, your intestines, all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's one way, okay? And, and, and the baby is also producing certain hormones which are going into the mother. Um, the, second, the second way is behavioral, okay? So this is when the mother, for example, strokes her abdomen or when she talks to the baby, sings to the baby, dances with the baby, so to speak. Um, all those things are behavioral and they communicate. They communicate love or, or, or no, no interest at all in the baby, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a big difference between a mother who talks to the baby and sings to the baby and even plays with the baby uh, and the mother who just totally ignores it, right? So the baby is going to get some kind of a sense of what kind of a mother uh, I have here. And the baby can also communicate, you know, um, particularly by kicking. Mm -hmm. So when the baby is having a good time, then the baby kind of moves almost in a dance, very melodiously, sort of slowly inside the womb. And it's very pleasant for the pregnant woman. But when the baby is upset, it can actually kick and kick hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have met two women in my, in, in, in my life who actually had their lowest uh, rib broken by mm -hmm. their baby who mm -hmm. kicked so hard that he actually broke one of her ribs. One of those ladies was in a recording studio and she was recording with a very loud band and the baby got more and more upset. And you see, there's a difference again between a woman who will respond to that correctly by leaving the room and a woman who will stay and say, oh, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Those are all communications, right? So, uh, so the baby can communicate. And then the third one, which of course is, is scientifically more difficult to explain, uh, is a kind of mental psychic communication. And um, the way I try to explain that uh, is that, for example, we know that twins, twins, all, they might be hundreds of miles apart, but if something really important happens to one, the other one feels it. If one is in a car accident, or if they are very sick or anything like that, there have been many, many accounts of twins feeling it right away, okay? And in order to explain that, we really have to go into quantum biology, <coughs> excuse me, and quantum mechanics. And actually, that's the book that I'm working on right now. Wow. Uh, yes. And I'm working on a new book, which at the moment is called The Hidden Brain. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about cellular intelligence and mm -hmm. cellular memory and things of that nature. It's very exciting. But anyway, so, you know, when two particles at one time were together and then they are separated, uh, it's called entanglement in quantum mechanics. And so that's what happens to twins, you know, that at one time they were, of course, very close together. And when they are separated, they are still somehow in communication. And even on a simpler level, if I'm talking to you, if we were somewhere in a room and I'm talking to you, and someone is looking at me from behind, I almost always can feel that, right? I look, I look, and there's the person who has been looking at me, right? How, how did I know that? Mm -hmm. uh, we were not connected by an umbilical cord, 
um, these are vibrations that somehow our brains are able to pick up on. So I have many accounts of women dreaming about what's going on in the womb with their child. And, and very often when, for example, they are just before uh, a, a, an abortion, like, a, like not, not an induced abortion, just a miscarriage, mm -hmm. uh, they might dream the dream of a child, something like, you know, I'm close to a precipice and I'm falling, 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 you know, that kind of thing. So there are these three levels of communication and all of them, of course, work together at the same time. They are not separate, only in terms of us discussing it, are they separate? But they're all happening at the same time. And so that is the way the baby learns uh, about the outside world, about the mother. Um, I, I often say that the womb is your first classroom. Mm -hmm. That's where you first learn, you know, about the world. And of course, if there's a war going on outside or if there's hunger or anything like that, all of that the baby will learn about through his mother. Yes, and that is amazing. There was, I remember when I was doing my own research, there was a case also of a woman that um, had woke up in the middle of the night yes. and um, there was a storm going on, but you know, it was okay, they were safe, she was just sleeping, and she woke up with a sense of fear. So then she understood that the communication was also going through the emotions that the, she was perceiving from her baby, because there was no reason for her to be frightened. But Very the clear. baby was perceiving, yes. he was frightened about what is going on. So she said that at the time, as she communicated with her baby and she said everything is fine it's just a storm and it happens that way but we are safe we are at home very the very sensation good. of fear yes yes so. disappeared yeah disappeared yes I, I say the same thing to to women who for example have somewhat turbulent um, relationships with their partners you know mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes they get into arguments when they do, I suggest very strongly that after the argument is over, that they talk to their baby and explain that, you know, your dad and I had an argument, but it does not involve you. Everything is fine. We are looking forward to having you, you know, and calming the baby down because mm -hmm. uh, that, that baby will be upset by the exchange of hostile, angry words. Yes. So yeah. we now understand that the environment that we create outside and inside yes. uh, of the womb can influence the, the baby, can affect the baby. And how it. can that affect later in the adult life of that child? Because through your research, I'm sure that now you have cases where you have fallen through, you know, pregnancy, study the pregnancy, everything that was going on. And how can that affect then the adult life? Well, we can sort of make some general statements, but from my experience, I think it's very important to point out that um, we are not into, into predictions. Like, you know, you cannot say, if this happens, that will happen, okay? Mm -hmm. um, we are talking about contributing factors, uh, but not causality, okay? Uh, a lot of people have sort of mistaken what I say in my books as kind of, you know, that it's written in stone. Like if you had a stressful pregnancy, your child is going to, uh, to, to perhaps be born already stressed and perhaps uh, even something might happen to his brain and he won't be as smart as the next kid, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I would just like to warn your listeners, you know, not, not to go that route, okay? I think it's important to, I mean, it's just like in life, you know, uh, there's a lot of good advice out there in terms of what to eat, what to drink, how to live, do yoga. I do yoga twice a week, sometimes mm -hmm. three times a week. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, do yoga, exercise, <clears throat> all these things are good. All these things are good. But, you know, once again, you know, every once in a while at one of my lectures, you know, somebody will put up their hand and say, well, you know, my father, you know, he smoked and he drank and he lived until 85. 
as if somehow that would disprove the fact that smoking and drinking is not good for you. Yeah. It does not disprove it. There, there are always exceptions. Um, and also we know that just because you smoke and drink doesn't mean that you're going to die young. But we do know that it increases your risks, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's what we have to look at in terms of pregnancy and birth and all those other things. And I think that all, all the research, all the research in the world shows very clearly that if the mother is stressed, um, and if she's stressed, we, we are not talking about running after a streetcar for five minutes, okay? Uh, that is a healthy stress. That's not going to do any harm to your baby. But we are talking either about a very acute uh, experience of stress, such as, for example, your mother dying, okay, while you are pregnant. That would be a good example, or losing a job, or having to move suddenly, you know, when you're not prepared for it, anything like that. So if you either suffer acute stress, which is very bad for the baby, and I'll tell you why, and, or you can go into chronic stress, low chronic stress. Uh, for example, a 16-year-old woman uh, who is pregnant and she doesn't know whether she's going to keep the baby or not. She may not even know who the father of the baby is. She may be unemployed. So she is just like constantly worried, constantly worried, not in a huge way, but, you know, on, on a low scale. So in either of those cases, you see, unfortunately, what happens is that uh, the uh, adrenal gland continues to produce cortisone. And uh, that is a very destructive hormone uh, if it is present in large or in continued concentration. And what it does is, and this, this is so simple and so easy to understand, what it does is that it interferes with the way the brain develops. Because the brain, uh, during gestation, during pregnancy, produces something like 50,000 new neurons every second. Okay, In order to end up with, with a billion neurons in your brain, you have to make them very, very fast all the time. Mm -hmm. And because these cells are so immature, they are, very, they are very vulnerable. So the cortisone or nicotine or alcohol, uh, any of the opioid drugs, they all interfere with cellular development in the brain. And so in either of those two cases, like the acute stress or prolonged chronic stress, what you end up with is a miswiring of the brain. This is the important thing. Uh, so instead of, you know, like a computer, instead of being wired perfectly, you know, a few, a few wires are missing mm -hmm. uh, because many of the cells are destroyed by cortisone and similar, and, and similar hormones, but especially cortisone. So that many cells are destroyed, many cells instead of, as they were, each cell is programmed to go to a certain point in, in the brain. And that program is interfered with when you have large concentrations of cortisone in the brain. So, you know, cell A, instead of going to point X, will go only to point Y or point mm -hmm. Z. And when that happens to millions of nerve cells, you have a miswiring of the brain. So that child is going to be born already handicapped. And mm -hmm. there's no doubt about that. Now, again, you know, um, children are very re resilient. And we do have new neurons being born, you know, all the time, even as adults. For example, in the hippo hippocampus, you have, um, you have 10,000 new neurons a day. Uh, being born, but also a lot of them are being destroyed every day. So, you know, it's a balance between destruction and, and production. But the important thing is that some of this can be repaired with loving, kind parenting, and some of it can't. Yes. Um, there are women that ask me when they yes. start the program, um, Susanna, but I didn't know about this, and now I am 20 weeks, or now I am 25 weeks. What can I do, right? Because there is um, this understanding, and I would say misunderstanding, that, you know, this time has passed. Now I can't do anything about that time. 
And well, it's that's not true. true. Yes. Yeah, it's not true. You can always do something. I mean, you know, you can, you can give them the example of someone who has smoked for 20 years and the lungs are all black with nicotine. But when they stop smoking, the lungs gradually recover. Okay? We, we have, like I said, you know, children and humans in general have huge built-in kind of a resilience. And so the first thing is not to feel guilty because you didn't know that you were pregnant. So let's get rid of the guilt. Uh, you did, and now you're going to do the best you can because you have asked me the question and I will tell you what you can do. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. and you start there, you know, we start today, you know, so you have 25 weeks. Okay, well, you still have, you know, 15 weeks in which you can do some good. Yes. And so, you know, you, you, you try to decrease their stress and you try to look at their relationships. Uh, you, you look at their job, you know, you don't want them to, to work uh, in a stressful environment. You don't want them to be exposed to inhaling toxins. Uh, and all those kinds of things, eat a healthy diet and um, make sure you have a midwife or a doula for your biz. Uh, make sure that you have a sympathetic doctor who will sort of follow uh, your program instead of his program. All those things. Yes. And another yeah. thing is a lot of the work that the APA does, yes. uh, the association does, it's also related with trauma. Yes. So we have adults that have some sort of trauma and then you go back and you realize that they have been struggling sometimes for years, sometimes their whole life. And they yes. suddenly understand that yes. this trauma happens on yes. pregnancy. Yes. How come, how come, how are we able to translate this trauma to, you know, what happened during pregnancy? Um, and to move forward from that. You mean in terms of therapy, like what's yes, of yes. Well, first of all, um, there are very few people still who who you know uh, work on work in a way that would um, go back to you know birth trauma. Like you know, mm -hmm. I mean, we have. Uh, I don't know how many we have, but you know, we have a very strong, APA has a very strong educational program now, mm -hmm. and a lot of people take that program. Yes. And, and so some of them, you know, become therapists, of course, and those people then are well equipped to deal with this. But if you were to go, you know, to your local psychiatrist or something like that, the chances are that they would just look at you like you are from Mars or something, you know. Yes, like, exactly. Um, exactly. You know, really what is that i've never heard yeah. of such a thing so obviously you know you have to go to someone who is familiar with that concept um and again you know there, there are many different ways like unfortunately you know there is no one therapeutic um tool uh or 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 orientation that will for sure help person A or B or C. You have to try out this different things. Uh, but, you know, like, for example, hypnotic regression would be a good way to go mm -hmm. to get into that. Or, uh, or some kind of a, a Reiki and Oregon kind of, uh, you know, body work. Sometimes mm -hmm. uh, you are able to get back to early uh, life beginnings, uh, early lifetimes. Um, but the important thing perhaps is just to be with someone who is empathic and understanding. And so if that person can just talk gradually over a period of time, uh, there's no fast route to getting better with, with an early trauma because it's very hidden, it's very deep, uh, it's rather inaccessible to uh, usual ways of counseling. Mm -hmm. So I think that you would have to prepare that person if you were counseling them you would have to prepare that person for like a long term kind of a relationship with an empathic uh therapist no matter what their background is as long as as long as they know about this you know yes, yes. and then you know and then also to be with a therapist who is not sort of like a, a, 
like a, a one horse pony, you know, a one pony circus. Mm -hmm. um, the person who only has a hammer to him, all problems become nails. Yes. And that, that brings me exactly for the next question. Because when you started 30 years ago, you told me, you know, it was hard work. And, yes. you know, it was about spreading the word, spreading the knowledge, spreading the research, yes. right? Yes. Yes. So how do you think, how important still is today to get people to know the field that you work on, the research that you work on? And as you, and you, as you just told me, a lot of people that are working, you know, in psychotherapy and so on, they, they don't work on this field. And comparing it to when you started decades ago, how do you think that now um, the situation has evolved? Oh, well, um, it, there's, no, there's no comparison. There's no mm -hmm. comparison. Uh, I mean, like this conference, you know, that uh, was just held recently in Bristol, England, where your friend mm -hmm. Anna was, was there. Uh, I mean, so many people talked about therapy, you know, therapy, therapy, with, uh, therapy with children. Uh, there was a, an incredible um, presentation um, by a uh, psychotherapist from Switzerland. His first name is Klaus, Klaus Kappeli. And he talked about treating children born through ART, um, assisted reproductive technologies. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he gave some tremendously interesting case histories of, uh, you know, just having in his room all kinds of dolls and toys and essentially play therapy. And many times the children would just reenact their birth trauma just, just by with the dolls, et cetera, without any words. You know, it was, it was very obvious. And then he would translate what they have done into words. He would put words to, to what they did, you know. So if they took a doll, and you threw it and throw it in, into a corner, he would say, well, you know, um, perhaps that was your brother who died while, you know, your twin who died during your mother's pregnancy, things like that. And, and he has worked wonders. And there were many other people who, who are into psychotherapy. So I think the thing to do is simply to find out who in your area, you know, uh, has has joined our ranks, so mm -hmm. to speak, and then I mean it's like yoga. You know, you might have uh, a, a small town somewhere, uh, and someone is looking for yoga, and they can't find anybody, so they call you because they know that you're a yoga teacher, and you can tell them, yes, you know, five miles outside of your town, there's a good yoga teacher. So networking, yes, yes, yes. And another thing is, how do you see? Um, the um, today's world in terms of how are we creating the right environments for women and for babies how is today's society being able to considering the work and the research that you have done and how how can that be put up in practice because we usually are you know i have three children I went through the system and usually doctors talk about, you know, eat healthy, drink right. fluids and all that, but they don't talk about this. No. no. How much uh, work do we still need to do so that this is put out there? How do you see this? Well, th there's a lot of work to be done, but also we have, we have progressed, you know, things are different. Um, when I first started, I, uh, I talked about uh, the lack of anesthesia, for example, mm -hmm. uh, when there was surgery performed on, on newborns or even small children without anesthesia. I mean, it was barbaric, barbaric. And uh, that has changed. That has changed totally. Um, I think that, you know, the acceptance of midwives is, is much greater now than it used to be. Um, there are birthing centers in many, many places, which again is a good thing. Um, but I, yeah, in, 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 in fact, in fact, there are many, many hospitals that have even birthing rooms, you know, mm -hmm. and allow women to birth their babies without 
interference, you know, without trying to, to have too much, you know, done to them. Um, I was, uh, I'm trying to remember, um, I forgot where this was, but I think it was in some hospital here in Canada um, where every woman had an episiotomy. Every woman. Mm. It was must. It was absolutely basic. And if the doctor did not have time to do an episiotomy before birth, they did an episiotomy after birth. Can wow. you believe that? Wow. Can you believe that? So those kinds of things have, have stopped, okay? Mm -hmm. We don't have those barbaric practices anymore. We don't have doctors pulling the baby out by their, by their uh, feet and dangling it over the mother, sort of like a trophy. Look what I've done, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so things are getting better all the time, and they are going to improve even more the more women insist on having, you know, a, a good proper birth. In, in terms of what's good for the baby, not just for them. Uh, the doctors are always concerned with the health of the woman mm -hmm. and then with the health of the baby. But that the baby would have any kind of emotions or feelings never enters their minds. Mm -hmm. So we, we have to talk to the doctors. You know, every woman who wants to have a child has to talk to the doctor. She has to hold up a book, you know, whether it's mine or somebody else's and say, you know, here is the book, you know, here's the science, read it. And if you don't want to read it, I'll tell you what's in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I had a doctor telling me, you know, tell women to tell us what to do. Yes. And I yes. thought that it was, that it was very, very, very powerful. Yes. What yes. do you think is the role of the partner? Because as we have mentioned before, the partner is also the creator of the environment where the pregnant woman is. Absolutely. So what is the role of the partner? How important that is? It's very important. Um, the research that I have done shows that um, the most important, the following five things are important in terms, psychologically important in terms of uh, the mother having a positive birth experience and a healthy baby. The first one is desire for a child. Very, very super important, okay? Mm -hmm. If the mother really, really wants to have a baby, uh, that is absolutely imperative. It's like putting some kind of a shell around the baby so that nothing will impact on it, uh, him, her, uh, in a negative way, wanting a baby. Second most important thing is her own birth experience. Uh, if you had a cesarean birth yourself uh, or any difficulties, 36 hour labor or whatever, you were born as a result of that, then while you're pregnant, those kinds of memories come back and they undermine your um, belief in yourself okay, your self-esteem, all that kind of thing becomes a little bit shaky. The third one is relationship to the mother. And so if you had a very positive relationship with your mother, that is good. If you had a negative relationship. And the fourth one is, um, is the partner. And it's usually in that order. Um, and, and so... The partner can uh, is is very important because if they have a good relationship, well, you know, it it can overcome a lot of fear because the fifth the fifth problem or or opportunity, depending how you look at it, mm -hmm. is that some women have a lot of irrational fears about birth. Okay, um, and so. Um, very often they will not even express them, but they have them because, because often they know that it's irrational and they don't want to be labeled as crazy or whatever. But it could be something like, you know, when I'm going to breastfeed, the baby is going to bite off my nipples. You know, that kind of a thing could happen. So we all know that if you are fearful, you kind of, you know, go into a holding pattern and you contract all your muscles. That's not good if you want to give birth, right? You want to 
relax your muscles, right? So that the baby can come out. So those five factors are very important. And you're asking about the partner. Yes, the relationship with the partner uh, going together with uh, with preparing for pregnancy, preparing for childbirth, those kinds of classes, perhaps going together to see the doctor for your monthly examination. Like, let this be sort of a, a project between you and your husband or partner instead of just carrying it by yourself. Mm-hmm. And, and, and husbands, certainly in the past, that again, you know, that's changing too. In, in the past, husbands kind of withdrew from the wife who was pregnant because this is woman's work. And I don't know anything about it. And anyway, I don't like blood and I don't want don't to see it. And, and women were afraid that if a husband, for example, was present at the time of birth, you know, that he would, you know, get the wrong picture of her with the baby coming out and perhaps even, you know, uh, blood and urine and God knows what, you know, coming out of her vagina, this would set him for life, you know, against wanting to have any sort of a relationship with her. So women also had, you know, some uh, resistance to having husbands present at the time of birth and husbands, of course, you know, heard perhaps some stories about one of the things, you know, that would be very important to do in terms of partners is to talk about their fears Mm -hmm. and also to talk about their hopes for the child. Like if, if a father is only his, his, his major focus is I want to have a boy so that we can play baseball together. And then it turns out that they have a girl it's going to be a disaster, okay? Mm-hmm. Because he was just looking forward to having a boy and, and perhaps they did not have any tests. Uh, so they didn't know what sex the child was going to be. So I think it's really, really important to talk about your hopes and your fears. Um, husbands are, are very afraid by and large that the wife will focus all her attention on the baby and that they will lose really a partner perhaps for two or three years, whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, Wives are afraid that their husband will not be interested in them sexually. Like all these things can happen. And so it's really, really, really important to talk. And one of the things that you also mentioned is the the importance of the bonding process that happens, the prenatal bonding process. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that also is influencing the mother, is influencing the father. How does that happen? Yeah. Well, you know, the main thing that we have not said and and needs to be said is that people for a long time have underestimated the the mental development of, of babies. And we can certainly say with absolute certainty, really, I have absolutely no, no doubts about this. With absolute certainty, we can say that from the six months after conception, in other words, at the end of the second trimester, you know, that baby is, is a sensing, feeling, a sensible human being who can actually lay down memories that has been proven. And so, you know, this idea that, that it's sort of like a little goldfish in, in a bowl of whatever, water, whatever, um, it's, it's, it's wrong. It's wrong. You know, there is a tiny little human being in there. Mm -hmm. And so you have to treat that baby in that sense. Okay. It's not just a blob of protoplasm. It's much more. So, you know, uh, everything really starts there. And if you realize that there is like a living, tiny little creature there, then of course, you know, you don't want that creature to feel alone or abandoned. You want to pay attention to it. So, you know, talking to the baby, all the things that I said before, mm-hmm. um, very, very important. And that is the way that you prenatally bond with your child. And that is how the child, you know, attaches itself to you. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, after the child is born, uh, you just continue along that path. It's not a new beginning. It's just a continuation. And that will make, it, make the transition from intrauterine life to the outside world much smoother and much easier. Mm-hmm. And the child is going to be a lot healthier. Yes. And one of the things that uh, women have also um, experienced is that when that connection is there, 
even labor, the way labor is perceived and labor happens and that transmission from what we could say the water world to the earthly right. world, the more right. gravity and so on. So the new um, adaptation that baby has to do, it's much more smoother, it's more easy. The mother has a big influence on that and the baby has a big influence if the mother is also understanding that this is a process that they are together as a team. Yes, you got it. Yes. So thank you so much, Dr. Thomas Burney. It was such a nice conversation. I hope this is the first from many others that you can have. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed thank it. so much. Thank you. Until next time.